Uh, my name is Steve Sloda. I'm one of the co-administrators of the Educational Technology Program here at the University of Connecticut. And today I'm going to be talking to you about a project we've been working on for about the last two and a half years or so. It's actually designed to be a free, publicly accessible, browser-based experience for teachers, administrators, professional development specialists, and others who are interested in the realm of education. So regardless of which grade level you teach, there is a use for this particular tool for all of you. And it's centered on improving the way that we actually do our job of teaching. So it's not just about helping the students become better at whatever your disciplinary content is. It's actually designed to help make you a better teacher. And before I get too far into this, I do want to say that the funding for this project is, a, uh, is the result of contributions from the University of Connecticut Educational Technology Program two summers. And it's designed to support that particular program. So even though it's free and publicly accessible to everybody, we built this specifically with the program in mind to be able to assess the educators who are a part of that master's and sixth year program. So a little bit about myself very briefly. I work, again, I work here at UConn. I am an educator. I work in the School of Education in the uh, Educational Psychology Department. I previously was a high school teacher. I taught life science, anatomy and physiology and human genetics. And my job at the university is a little bit unique because in addition to working in the School of Education, I also have a dual appointment to the School of Fine Arts in the Department of Digital Media Design. And so I teach a combination of courses that involve learning theory and ed tech and instructional design. But I also teach things like interactive storytelling and game systems and accessibility design. So I get this nice array of opportunities to be able to share with people the overlaps between what educators do and what game designers do. And it turns out, as I'm going to point out today, those two jobs are actually quite similar. There's a lot of overlap there. And that's one of the reasons why we think this tool is particularly useful to help educators get better at what they do. Now, I mentioned very briefly I was previously a high school teacher. That's one of the things that got me interested in this line of work. So I worked in Manchester School District as a high school educator. I then worked as a tech specialist within that district. And when I returned to school to get my doctorate in ed tech, I ended up uh, going into game design or educational game design explicitly to help other educators build games or instructional media to be able to facilitate the teaching that they do. So a lot of what I do now for the Two Summers program is directed toward helping people create playful experiences that will teach students more effectively, more efficiently, uh, get them more engaged, motivate them, and to create this transferable content that's going to move from the classroom environment to the, the real world practice that we want them to actually accomplish. So here's a couple samples of the work that we do here. Not necessarily the projects I'm going to talk about today, but if you are interested in them, they are listed on our EdTech website. So you can see there's a variety of options here. We do virtual reality projects, we do analog and card games, uh, so helping people assess their learning through the play of specific kinds of cards or through board games that we've designed. Uh, my colleagues and I also write a lot about the use of play in education and storytelling in education. I'm currently co-authoring a book with a colleague at Rochester Institute of Technology called The World Building Workshop, and it's all about how you can use world building and world modeling as a pedagogical tool in your classroom environment. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, check out Trent Hergenrader up at RIT. He's an expert in creative writing and in the use of world building for teaching and learning. Um, another project I'm not going to spend a ton of time on today, but I, I thought I would introduce just in case you're interested in it. Uh, we have a virtual reality experience we're developing in collaboration with the Dodd Center here on campus. So if you were aware of the news when uh, the President Biden came to campus back in the fall, he was coming to honor uh, Thomas Dodd, who was a state senator as well, or he was a senator for the state of Connecticut and uh, was also one of the lead prosecutors at Nuremberg, the war tribunal that took place after World War II. And so we have all of the documents, the primary source documents from that event, and we've been using the archives to be able to cultivate this narrative experience centered on the history and legacies of the Holocaust. And we're rebuilding courtroom 600, which is the courtroom where the Nuremberg trials took place, in virtual reality using a storytelling method to be able to help people become primary source archivists, to help them utilize these virtual reality primary source documents to better understand what took place at the war tribunal and how that maps to what's happening now in the world, or how the history is linked between that point in time and this point in time. We also have incorporated a number of voices that were excluded during that war tribunal, so people of color, women, 
and uh, the Jewish resistance, all of whom were sort of excised surgically from the proceedings as they occurred. And we've taken into account all of the Holocaust survivor testimony we have available to us to be able to seed those stories back into what took place at the time. So that's another very exciting project we're happy to share with all of you. If you're interested in that, please do check it out. Uh, it's uh, under development at this stage, so it's not quite available for other people to try yet, but we do have a uh, series of relationships with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as well as the Shoah Foundation, and we're working to create an exhibit that would go into those uh, museum spaces to be able to educate the public about the importance of these kinds of resources and why we should continue to care about and study these things. So as I was saying when I got started, play and learning is really the central focus of my research here at the university as well as that of my colleague, Dr. Michael Young, who is the administrator for the EdTech program. He's my former advisor, so when I went through my doctoral program, he was my major advisor. He was the one who helped me with my dissertation. And we've done a lot of writing together about the utility of games and play for teachers and learners. So up here you can see some of the pillars of design that we've built our work around. And that includes some things that we've done, including a meta-analysis called the, uh, Our Princesses in Another Castle, which is centered on the utilization of games for learning and what we've taken away from you know, the last decade and a half of people doing that kind of research. But we also utilize the work of other scholars who do similar kinds of things, uh, like James Paul G., uh, Jane McGonigal, and others who've done meta-analyses since ours was published in 2012. And that's all fed into this broad scope, large picture kind of philosophy that we have about designing for teachers and learners. And you can see up here that I've included a number of different categories or modalities, right? We have what educators do. You build a course that's broken into units, that's broken into lessons, that's broken into activities. That's actually fundamentally the same thing that game designers do, that movie producers do, that authors do. We're all looking at a big picture or about the theme that we want to communicate and then breaking that theme into digestible chunks that can be used to help students put together a beginning, middle, and end structure to make sense of the thing that they're learning. So as I'm talking about teaching and learning in the context of games and play and storytelling, this is the framework that I'm using. And one of the most important facets of this, and one that I don't think gets enough attention, is that in order for transfer to happen, now how many of you are in-service educators or you're teaching? So at least a few of you, right? You've probably noticed in the past that it's really hard to convince your students that there's a utility for the thing they're learning as they're learning it. So, for instance, if I'm in a, in a math class and I'm learning about fractions, it might be pretty hard to convince a fifth grader that there's a reason they need to know about fractions. That's actually one of the things that I'm really interested in, is how do you get students to understand the application of what they're doing? Because when I was teaching biology, I frequently was positioned to listen to students asking the question, why? Why do I need to know this? Why do I need to know what the cell organelles do? Why do I need to know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, right? And the only way that you're gonna get students to apply that information is if you can show them a context in which it makes sense or in which they would actually apply that information in the real world. So when we're designing lessons or when we're designing educational games, we're always thinking about this one-to-one -one ratio between the learning objective or the thing we want the students to learn and the game objective or the play objective. And the reason for that is because if we can get students to apply in the context of a game or in play, the thing we want them to do in the real world, it reduces the barriers to transfer. It makes it easier for them to understand why and how you should learn about something so that it can be utilized outside the classroom environment. So as I go through this particular project, I'm gonna be referring back to this one-to-one -one ratio, the idea that what we've tried to build is highly situated, or we've tried to create something ritually authentic that's going to help students understand implicitly why they would want to know this, or what purpose it would have outside the realm of the game as it's self-contained. So the project in particular that I'm gonna focus on is called EOS 503. Eos is the Greek god of dawn, the, the idea that there's a new rising sun every day. And as you can probably tell from looking at the logo imagery, it's a palindrome, which is kind of easy to remember. And the entire game centers on this space station called Eos 503, or Eos, that is broken into a number of communes that all have different philosophies. And you as the player are positioned to think about what you can do to best help those particular communes solve the problems that are facing them. And all of these things are seeded with information that's relevant to teachers and the field of education more generally. So you can see some screen caps I've uh, put up here. 
these are just images of what the game looks like. You might, if you've played games like Pokemon before, or you've seen uh, similar kinds of video games, it is tailored to look like the kinds of things that a, a, a game lover might want to play. Um, but all of this is intentionally designed, again, to maintain that one-to-one -one ratio of game objective and learning objective. What made this challenging to design was figuring out how can you create a self-contained project that's sort of self-directed, that the player can decide what they want to do, that doesn't go all over the place in the same way that a Dungeons & Dragons open world role-playing game might do. So, uh, for instance, if you've, if you've heard about or played a role-playing game before, you know that there are books and you use your imagination and you're co-authoring this story with the other people who are playing. We wanted to maintain that kind of feeling where you had agency in the space in which you're playing to reflect the way the world really works, that you have agency and can make decisions based on your own perspectives. But we were confronted with this problem of needing to make it self-contained, that a video game has to have certain boundaries or parameters, that you can't just go and you know, manifest a race car and start driving around just because you want to. You have certain constraints that are put on you as a player. So we're constantly thinking about what is the appropriate balance of player agency and the learning objectives that we actually want to target, which are related to the ISTE standards for technology coaches. To give you a very brief overview of how this works, again, it was designed by and for the UConn uh, Two Summers Educational Technology Program in collaboration with students and graduates of the UConn Digital Media Design Program or the Game Design Program. And our goal is to focus on the relationships between particular stakeholders and the larger environment or community in which they're a part. So just like a technology coach who's working at a school district, you have to think through what are the needs or wants of my stakeholders and how can I satisfy all of these disparate needs and wants to make sure that everybody gets essentially some solution that's going to give them uh, a sense of, of peace and prosperity and uh, achievement within that particular community space. We intentionally target this ISTE standard, the change agent standard. One of the reasons for that is because of uh, accreditation and the way that we think about which of the uh, specific standards are the hardest to achieve or could be best achieved through a role playing experience. Uh, students who are in the educational technology program do a practicum in the fall semester, so they're actually in their school or in their teaching and learning environment. They apply some kind of tool or software or hardware to be able to evaluate and research that particular tool. But one of the things that's really difficult that we found is to get people to take on the role of being a visionary leader, to think through how does a leader solve problems? How does somebody actually do that negotiation with stakeholders? Because you can't necessarily drop somebody into an existing community and just tell them, hey, you get to free reign of this space. You get to decide what the school district's going to do or what its initiatives should look like or how the teachers should behave. It actually takes a lot more time and energy to cultivate the relationships that make that possible. So we thought a lot about how can we simulate that? How can we give students the practicum experience associated with being a visionary leader without necessarily having to build out all of the actual real world relationships necessary to make that possible? And so we started with this change agent perspective and visionary leadership as our goal and started thinking through, okay, how can we use this, this particular ISTE standard to craft game objectives that align with that standard? And what would it mean for an educator to participate in that practice or simulation such that they're able to transfer, again, that information from that learning environment to the real world environment where they are a practicing educator? So you can imagine that somebody who comes into the tech program is thinking about becoming a technology coach for their district, or they have aspirations to be an administrator, or maybe they're interested in going into creating professional development workshops. We had to think through what would that look like if we wanted somebody to take on that role and practice the skills associated with it. And not only that, but create consequences that would be related to or simulations of what would happen in the real world. You might have played games like this before for training sessions. You know, I have to do my compliance training and they always try to gamify it in some way, which means usually they have little cartoons on the screen that say like, hey, Billy did something unethical. What would you do if you were Billy? You know, and we, we wanted to avoid that kind of feeling because it's, it's very artificial. And usually you don't have agency in those situations. So you can't do the unethical thing. The game only allows you to do the ethical thing in order to sort of steer your behavior or keep you on one particular trajectory. And we were interested in what would happen if a particular user or a particular player or a particular teacher wanted to explore the downsides of taking a particular action. 
And the reason for that is because we think that there's actually a relationship between the choices a player makes and what they take away from a play experience. Uh, I frequently invoke this example from a conference I went to probably 10 years ago now where we were watching, uh, I think, researchers from MIT who were talking about SimCity EDU, which was SimCity, if you're unfamiliar, is a simulation that uses uh, essentially data from the real world to create the city that you would ultimately build commercial, industrial, and residential areas in, or streets, or sewage systems. And that research was centered on helping students reduce the pollution in the city. So the goal for the students was to get the pollution below a certain threshold by putting in green technologies and reducing the amount of industrialization in favor of other forms of commerce. And one of the things that stuck out at me at the time was the fact that the users or the researchers were only looking for users who met that goal. They weren't looking for users who did things antithetical to that goal. So some students, rather than reduce the pollution in their city, actually did the opposite, and they tried to make the city as polluted as possible. That made me wonder, like, why are you counting those as outliers, or why are you not incorporating them into the data? Because if you're able to manipulate the system to do that, it means you must fundamentally understand the goals of the exercise. So even though it didn't achieve the end that the researchers were looking for, those students' behaviors were really interesting and valuable. And it didn't mean they weren't learning. And I think that's actually a really important part of this, is that just because you choose something that may be unethical or may not be the correct answer does not mean you're not learning. The same thing could be true of playing a variety of other games for entertainment. So I think a lot about Grand Theft Auto. You've probably all heard of Grand Theft Auto, usually in negative connotations. But if you gave a five-year-old Grand Theft Auto and told them to play the game, they might just play the game to drive the car around and do race cars, or maybe they're going to pretend that they're going to the grocery store, right? So their interactions in that space are just as authentic as somebody who's actually following the objectives as they were prescribed by the designer. And it's not really anyone's call as to whether or not those students are learning or not learning. Really, you have to think more deeply about what are you assessing and why are you assessing it that way. And so that's what gave us the idea to explore this as a choose-your-own-adventure story, where there are multiple branching pathways, all of which converge at the end and give you an outcome commensurate with your behavior in that space. And again, the purpose of this is to be able to give educators an opportunity to think through what happens if, as a tech coach or as somebody working as an educator, I make certain kinds of choices and make certain kinds of recommendations, either that are in favor or actually move towards some specific goal that you know, pro-social, where I want a positive outcome, or anti-social, where I'm doing things that purposely make people unhappy. And um, what happens as a consequence or a downstream effect of doing that? So we lean into these two models. One of them is the ADDIE model for instructional design. If you're familiar at all with ADDIE, it's a pretty common instructional design practice. It's utilized in game design and a variety of other spaces as well. It's very simply summarized as doing a needs analysis, designing the thing that you want to create based on the data that you've collected, developing that product, so going through user testing and play testing and focus groups, and then implementing that project in the real world to actually utilize it for the purpose that it was designed. And the whole time you're going through this cycle, you're evaluating data. You're, you're collecting data from users, you're collecting data from your design team, you're going back and looking at your needs analysis to figure out are you actually achieving the goal you set out to achieve. And alongside that ADDIE model, we rely on Kohler and Mishra's TPAC model, which um, if you're at this conference, you may have heard about before, the TPAC model. This idea that technology is not just some other thing that exists outside of education, but is actually integral to the way that we think about master teaching and best practices. So for instance, if I'm teaching a biology course, I know that I have my content knowledge about Gregor Mendel and Punnett squares and genetics. I might have my pedagogical knowledge about the best way to teach that particular kind of information, but it's also really important to think through what kinds of tools am I using to communicate that information effectively. So technology doesn't exist outside of that pedagogical and content knowledge sphere. It's actually integral to understanding how you can effectively create multiple modalities for your students to interact with those ideas and be able to, again, transfer them out of the classroom into the real world. This is something that actually came up earlier when we were doing our Q&A down in the, the main auditorium where folks were talking about lessons learned through the COVID pandemic. Technology is an integral part of our lives now. Education is sort of like the Borg from Star Trek. Like it was an impenetrable sphere where technology couldn't get in until the pandemic happened. And then suddenly everybody was dependent on that technology. 
And we see this as an opportunity to rethink the way that teachers and schools structure themselves to make technology an integral part of what you do. Whether you're somebody who considers yourself very tech savvy or somebody who considers yourself a Luddite or you don't want anything to do with technology or tech phobic, it's, it's a reset button, an opportunity to really think through what does it mean to be an effective educator in the 21st century. So the entire time we've been working on this project for the last two and a half years, we've been focused on these two models, constantly getting evaluative feedback from the people who are going to be utilizing it for assessment and learning, as well as thinking through what are the theoretical best practices for educators to be using technology in ways that actually are meaningful in their classrooms. Another component of this is a, another oft overlooked element of teacher education, which is learning theory. A lot of folks will get like a learning theory class, maybe three credits or so, and you might hear about Vygotsky and Piaget and that's it. Like you never hear about anybody else in education who does anything with theory. We actually see that as being sort of a fourth Venn diagram bubble in that TPAC model. So for educators, it's not enough to just know your content, your technology, and your pedagogy, but also what is the foundation on which all of those things are resting? So if you were to think about that tri-circle Venn diagram, really underneath all of that is good theory or good learning science, information that dictates how and why people learn in different ways. This particular game, EOS 503, is structured around all of the learning theories that we teach here at UConn in our learning theory courses. That includes things that are pretty straightforward, like behaviorism and conditioning, all the way through more complex and contemporary views of learning theory, like situated cognition, social learning, social constructivism, and constructionism. So we want educators to be knowledgeable about not just these things in the abstract, but also what are their actual applications in a classroom environment. It's not enough to say, like, I give my students tickets and then they behave better because I reinforce their behavior. We really need to be thinking through with every activity or lesson that we create, what is the underlying foundation for that? And how are we going to make it more effective? Or what is the best practice going to be? And that gets us to the overarching story or the play mechanics for this particular game, EOS 503. So the, the main thrust of this game is that you are a fixer. You're somebody who gets onto the space station. And your goal is to help fix problems for people. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you are a good, quote unquote, fixer. You could be a bad, quote unquote, fixer. You could intentionally make people's problems worse if that's what you really wanted to do. Uh, and there is a reason, again, that we, we took that particular approach. Um, in the first half of this game, which I'm going to showcase for you today, your goal as a fixer is to go around to the different elements of the community, all of which are grounded in different theories of learning or different philosophies of education. And you're going to help resolve conflicts that those individuals are facing. Now, not every single conflict is directly applicable to a classroom, but all of them are directly applicable to learning theory, or putting that another way, learning theory is the solution to the problem that you're trying to solve. So for all of these individuals who've run into challenges, you are the person with the knowledge about learning theory who's going to be able to help them resolve those issues and make their communities better places to live, brighter places to live, more functional, more efficient, whatever their particular philosophy of education is, and that's kind of the trick of this. As an instructional designer, frequently you're put into a position where either you need to be a specialist in one kind of learning theory, so if you're a situated cognivist, you look at every single problem through the lens of situated cognition, or you look at all of these problems as an eclectic, as somebody who draws a little bit on every learning theory. And our goal here was to create a choose-your-own-adventure in which you get to experiment with the different learning theories to solve different kinds of problems based on the context in which they are relevant. So we're not just telling you that, you know, for every single problem you have to use the same hammer hitting a nail. Instead, we're going to help you figure out which tool makes the most sense for the given problem that you're confronting. The second half of the game, which we're currently in development, uh, is actually based on the higher level or higher order relationship between a technology coach and the school in which they operate. So the first portion of the game is all about you as an individual interacting with and building relationships with other individuals. The second half is about using that influence you've accumulated with the community to instantiate different kinds of initiatives. So getting the uh, particular learning community or the broader community to be able to adopt new approaches that are going to affect everybody, not just that one person dealing with a problem. And as a consequence of the choices you make, your influence levels will go up and down and then ultimately simulate what it's like to work in a superintendent's office. So if you work in the, the main district office, you're going to be confronting problems that are not at the level of the individual classroom, but more likely at the level of a school or at the level of the whole district. And so we've tried to create an experience that zooms out from the very specific particulars of a classroom level 
uh, individual teacher relationship all the way up to what is a whole school district doing and how does it make those decisions? The uh, three main philosophies that we've sort of centered this game on are drawn from real world philosophies of education and the storylines that uh, are associated with each of these philosophies reflect the ideas that are embedded in them. So for instance, uh, the workers are a, they take the view of education for career training. The goal is that you educate people because you want them to get jobs, you want to have a robust economy. We also interrelated some uh, communication about how unions operate or the purpose of unions in schools, as well as what is the purpose of trades and how do you get students or get learners to appreciate that it's not just about going to college, but also about these practical skills that you would apply to be able to make society continue to run. The second group is the people, and they are built around the educational philosophy of education for democratization or education for civic responsibility. So teaching teachers about why it's important to think through the role of schools in creating a democracy or creating a functional uh, political system, a functional civic system. And then finally, we have the seekers who are based on the educational philosophy of self-actualization. So essentially going to school for the goodness of being a learner, for getting to learn more about the world and your place in it and your identity and what that means for you. So it's all about meaning making and specifically the arts and humanities. And each of these three stand in contrast to one another with a governor who represents that philosophy. So uh, at the top there with the workers, you see Regan Hamilton. With the people, we have Duncan Mathau. And with the seekers, we have Biff Wallace, all of whom are the embodiment of that particular philosophy of education. And it's going to be your job to convince these three people to work together, because all of them have their own philosophy on how this place should work. And you are the one person who has the skills necessary to be able to thread that needle and bring them together and help them co-solve a problem that otherwise they would be in conflict over. So I'm going to give you a very brief walkthrough of this before I turn you loose to try it for yourselves. So again, just to summarize, Act 1 of the game is based around narrative events. This is a choose-your-own-adventure story, so you're going to be the one that dictates how your individual interactions play out. And throughout your encounters with different individuals, you're going to be given a number of dialogue choices or didactic choices mm -hmm. that are going to allow you to decide how do I respond mm -hmm. to a given issue or a given challenge. Mm -hmm. Different kinds of characters will have different kinds of philosophies they espouse, but importantly, none of them are going to come out and just say like, hey, I'm a behaviorist or hey, I'm an information processing theorist. Like, it's, it's actually intended to be much more subtle than that because worldviews are actually really complicated. People believe all kinds of weird things for weird reasons, and they don't necessarily even have the terminology or language to communicate why they believe what they believe. And it's your job as a fixer or as this data agent to interpret what people say and find a solution that fits them and the environment in which they're working. So these narrative events are structured to be reflective of what it's like to actually work with people who you know, don't necessarily work in the instructional design field or don't necessarily work as tech coaches, who don't necessarily uh, have the experience of being in a learning theory course. So your goal ends up being to match the learning theory that's most appropriate for that individual based on the context of what they're saying, such that they're going to be satisfied with the outcome. And that's another facet of this that we were really intent on capturing was that there's replayability, that there's actually utility in playing through this multiple times to see how different kinds of people react to different kinds of solutions. And again, there is a quote unquote best answer based on the uh, particulars of an individual's philosophy or worldview, but that doesn't mean that the game stops just because you didn't match correctly like a multiple choice test. It's actually going to dictate a branching pathway that at the end of the game, even within an individual encounter, you're going to be able to see dynamics where the individual characters will respond differently and you will have different consequences based on what you say or do. The second half, again, I don't have to show you today. It's still under development. But the basic goal is that you can look up there and see the meters that are placed on the side. Uh, those meters will fluctuate based on your influence with a given faction. And those factions have, because of their different philosophies, will view your, inter your initiatives and your um, advice differently. So you're going to have to figure out how do I balance the interests of all of these different disparate groups to get them to uh, work together and stay happy. So, as your basic walkthrough, this is my player avatar character I made. Uh, I named them Wiggles because that seemed strangely appropriate for uh, doing a demonstration. And uh, we're actually really happy with the dynamics of this particular user interface system. One of the reasons why we wanted to make sure that there was an opportunity for the player to self-insert into this space 
was because it actually does matter that you have the ability to project yourself into the environment as opposed to just having a character given to you. Um, it has to do with the way that social learning theory operates, that uh, role models matter, and that having a character that's reflective of who you are and what you believe is really important if you're trying to internalize these ideas and then apply them out in your own real life. So we tried to construct a character creation system that will allow individuals to insert themselves into the game should they so choose such that they can actually imagine themselves in the role of being a fixer or being a data agent and therefore be able to solve these problems just like they would in the real world. The main goal of the quest that you're on, if you want to think of it that way, or the main thrust of your adventure, is to solve the problem of getting the three governors of these different communes to get along with one another, to come together and co-solve an issue. And uh, these governors, Hamilton, Wallace, and Matthau, they don't get along at the beginning of the game. At the end, you're going to have a final boss, uh, a narrative event, where you essentially get to govern or facilitate a meeting with them and get them to communicate with one another after a conflict has already happened. So it's essentially a form of conflict resolution through persuasion. You as the person with the most experience with learning theory and pedagogy, uh, with the most experience as being a tech coordinator, are going to be the one that gives them advice about how they can get through this hurdle that they have run into. There's also a secondary sort of B-plot, if you want to think of it that way, that forces you to have to solve this problem. You can't just walk away from it. And that's that when you come down to solve these issues for the various communes, uh, the conflict that breaks out in front of the elevator actually damages the elevator, and you can't leave until you've actually gone through and talked to the individuals who are in need of your help. So when you get down to an area we call the hub, which is sort of a neutral faction city that exists at the center of the other communes, you're going to be stuck there until you're able to convince the various factions to work together to repair the elevator so that you can gather all the governors and bring them together and solve their conflict. So it's actually kind of twofold. You have the branching pathways that are associated with each of the communes. You also have branching pathways or narrative pathways associated with how you resolve the conflict for the various governors. Uh, when you get to the center of the hub, which is indicated here with this little fountain and park that's in the middle of all of the other communes, you're given choice about where you want to go. You can start with the group, the workers, that are focused on unions and education for trade and career preparation. You can go south to the, uh, the People's Republic, where the focus is on civic education. Or you can go west to the Seekers commune, which is all based on self-actualization and the humanities and arts. And again, each region is designed to be reflective of that particular philosophy, and the plots associated with the characters that are in those areas are going to be reflective of the philosophies that are associated with them. So if you go to the workers' area, it's very heavily emphasized on unionization and the role of individual um, trades within that space. It's very mechanical. It's based on the notion that these are the people who are maintaining the space station. It's their job to keep things running. If you go to the People's Republic, those are the folks who are going to be thinking a lot about how do you get public discourse or civil discourse to occur? How do you get people to engage with one another and think through their problems as a group through sort of uh, small d democratic means where there's voting and you, you hear everybody's voice? And if you go to the Seekers area, there's a large art festival where you're actually talking to individuals about their views on whether or how the arts should be commercialized or monetized for the sake of preserving their economy. So each of these things are seated in there to be able to reflect the job of an educator that goes beyond the traditional, you have a classroom, you have to teach your content. It's instead looking at the bigger picture uh, that educators operate within, which is, how do I create a society for the future? How do I help students find their place in that society? Um, I've chosen to showcase the workers area here because it's one of the uh, first areas we created. The first thing you do when you get there is you meet with Governor Hamilton, who basically says, sure, I'll come to your meeting, that sounds good, but before you do that, you have to convince all the union leaders to end their strike and come back to the bargaining table. And so it actually positions you as the uh, mediator between the uh, one side, which is the leadership in this particular faction, from the union leaders who operate the cleaning union, the uh, agricultural union, and the repairers union, or the, the maintenance union. Uh, I've chosen Edith here, who's uh, the head of the Repairers Union. Uh, as you can see, she says we stand together. They're not going to flinch in the face of leadership. And if you want to help them compromise, you have to come up with a solution that's going to satisfy their needs. Now, every time you get to a character who has a narrative event, you're given the opportunity to either start that event or walk away from it if you'd rather investigate other areas first. 
So there, again, there's a lot of agency here that the player can then use to decide where do they want to go, what are they most interested in, where do they want to start and finish the game. And there are uh, benefits to being able to go to different areas first or last. It just depends on what your interests are and how you want to play through each time you play the game. Uh, if you select Talk Now, the individual character is going to tell you, here's what's going on, here's the problem I'm dealing with. And it's usually seated within the context of that broader narrative. So as I mentioned earlier with the way that games, books, movies, and classrooms are all hierarchical, uh, we started with the concept of here's your broad learning objective about the role of a tech coach based on the ISTE standards and then drilled down to individual activities within that hierarchy to be able to focus on the role of the tech coach with individual teachers or individuals uh, on this space station. So the important thing about this is that you have to read closely the context of what an individual is saying because again they're not going to come out and say I'm a behaviorist, I'm an information processing theorist, I'm a constructivist. They're going to use vocabulary cues that are going to let you know as the individual player whether and how you should approach a particular kind of solution. So I've underlined here the phrase, nobody's bothering to record what they've done. Now that should set off a light in, in my player mind to be able to think through, okay, what, what kind of person would be interested in records? What kind of person would be interested in information? What kind of person would be interested in memory and recall? And when I get to the next stage of this interaction, there are two options. I can either select my choice from the list of three that are sort of summarized there, and every choice is given sort of a shorthand version and then a longer version that expands to show you what that actual dialogue choice will do. Um, and in the circle there, you can see the little speech bubble. That brings up a conversation log. We thought it was really important that players would be able to see what people had said after they had said it. So there's a nifty little character named Two Blue, who's our mascot for the Two Summers program, who pops up and says, hey, this is what was just said. You can scroll through what an individual character had said to you previously and look for those context cues to be able to figure out, essentially through a puzzle-like format, uh, what is it that makes the most sense as a solution for this individual? So again, uh, Edith here has mentioned blueprints, notes, or a manual. She's talking about recordings. She's talking about storing information. So that should be getting us to think through, okay, what kind of learning theory or what kind of philosophy is best matched with that sort of outlook? And of, of our three choices here, we have re uh, rewards for documentation, references to similar technologies, and experimenting with new tech. Now, I've blown up the images here so they're a little bit easier to read, and I've underlined the relevant passages that are in each of those options. Um, I've also labeled them on the left-hand margin. So even if uh, you didn't know necessarily what these were, the, the, the notes are there to be able to clarify it. So we have a behaviorist choice, we have an information processing choice, and we have a constructionist choice. Now, I as the player am going to have to figure out which of these dialogue options is going to satisfy the needs of Edith most effectively. And if you look at the underlined text, you'll notice that the behaviorist option includes the words modify their behavior, rewards, give them a treat, improve the likelihood. So it's all phrasing that's related to behavioral reinforcement or operant conditioning. The second option, information processing, focuses on review, cataloging information, annotation, creating an encyclopedia. Those are all things that are associated with memory or cognitivism, this idea that we remember things and want to recall that information to solve a problem. And then the bottom option, constructionism, uses phrases like work it out, experiment, develop, disassemble, reconstruct, all of those things that would be associated with building something. So again, you as the player are thinking through which of these philosophies is going to make the most sense for Edith, who's really interested in how do I recall information, how do I catalog information, and in this particular case, the correct option is going to be, I'm going to let all of you guess, which one do you think it would be? Number two, I see some twos here, right? So yeah, Edith is an information processing theorist. She doesn't say that, but that's the kind of philosophy she applies in her work as the leader of the repairers union. Now, if I've correctly chosen that option, you'll see that Edith responds with a facial expression that's commensurate with her being thoughtful about the particular thing that you chose. Now, that's another form of sort of formative assessment that we've embedded in this is beyond just having the characters be static throughout the conversations, they change their emotional state based on how satisfied they are with your answer. So even though they're never going to come out and say, that's right, you did the right answer, you got it correct, 
they are going to act differently toward you whether they are increasingly happy or decreasingly happy. If they're uh, happy with the, or satisfied with the answer you gave or if they're dissatisfied with the answer you gave. You then well, you'll get a second option or a second choice to make about the next step. And every single one of these narrative events is tiered so that you do one initial uh, response and then a second response. For more advanced interactions, there are three opportunities. And then at the very end of the game, when you're interacting with the governors, you have a longer series of interactions where you're mediating between the three of them. So the game actually scaffolds you as a player up to the more sophisticated kinds of interaction. Um, similar situation here. I'm not going to go through all the details of this. Uh, if you play through the game yourselves, you'll have the opportunity to read through them. But again, you are given the same three options or the same three learning theories as your options. And you can utilize the textual clues to be able to decide what is the best philosophy or the best response for that particular individual. So in this case, our information processing option focuses on the development of a shared wiki, uh, a database, and then col uh, collaborating to create notes. So for somebody who wants to be able to store information, this seems like a really good option. Again, it's incorporating technology integration as part of the learning objective we've built into the game. So you're doing what the ISTE standard for chain agent is really asking you to do, which is to think through how do I convince somebody to in integrate a particular kind of technology or solve a problem in a particular kind of way, and uh, ultimately bring you around to uh, solving these problems for different individuals. So in this case, Edith is very satisfied that we've chosen our information processing trajectory. And she says, that's a solid answer. I can see how that would make things more efficient. Not bad, Wiggles. You did a good job. And uh, Edith is then satisfied. There is an indication that we added to make it clear that you've gotten the best of the three choices, where you get a little stamp that goes into your conversation log and then will be important at the end of the game when it showcases the branching options that you played through. So had we actually gone a different direction and chosen, say, behaviorism for Edith, Edith would not only seem unhappy or seem a little bit angry about the options that we have provided. Um, at the end of the game, you would see that the outcome for Edith is quite a bit different than it would be if we had selected the uh, more palatable options for her. So at the end, you'll be given a postcard for each of the characters you interact with, and those postcards will be written to reflect what ends up happening as a result of your advice. I mention all of this because I wanted to articulate what a gameplay loop actually is. And again, this is intended to be associated with or parallel to the change agent ISTE standard. So in the context of play, you are identifying a challenge, you're engaging with your stakeholders, and you're proposing a theory-based solution. And that's going to be the continuous cycle you go through as you interact with all of these different characters, all of whom have different personalities, different wants, different needs, different interests. And so it is very much like a choose your own adventure book where you're reading through what does a particular person care about and what do I want to do to make this person more or less satisfied and thinking through what could be the potential consequences if I take one course of action or another. Now, one of the potential applications of this, I had mentioned earlier we're not collecting data like you know, Facebook or Google or whoever. Um, we do actually have a system in place to be able to have people to opt in to give us data. So for instance, if we want to conduct research, which is our, ultimately our goal as part of an R1 institution, uh, we can assign user numbers or user IDs to individual players. So for instance, with our EdTech program, we assign a randomly generated number to individuals in the program and ask them to play. And then we compare their gameplay at the beginning of the program with their gameplay at the end of the program and look for correlations between their gameplay, the choices they make, and the individual actions or grades that they get in their portfolio throughout the year that they're in the program. So we're able to use this as an assessment tool, as a replacement for doing something like a traditional exam or a traditional portfolio. And you can see here, I'm not going to go through all the details of this. It's just a bunch of columns and an Excel spreadsheet. But essentially what you're looking at is a log file. It's a long form uh, articulation of data based on the actions an individual player took. And not only do we get that information, we also get to see how much time did they dwell on a particular activity. So if they sat on one part of the map for a really long time, we can see how long they sat there. If they clicked an object, we can see what object they clicked. And this is actually really important because we need to be able to look at what options did people choose and how quickly did they choose them. So if you were talking to Edith and you selected the correct answers but only spent three seconds looking at the answers, we can make we can infer that that person didn't actually read through the dialogue content. They just clicked the one that seemed most appealing. 
Um, and the reason why we want to be able to do this is to, again, look at the correlation between individual actions taken in the game and the performance of an individual learner in the ed tech program. Now, um, we specific, again, we've specifically designed this for the two summers ed tech program. We have talked about making user IDs available for anyone who wanted to do this kind of research. So for instance, if you were working with a school district as an administrator, you might be interested in having your teachers try something like this for a PD. You could use user IDs to be able to collect that data about your individual educators and then use that data to make some decisions about how do we debrief about this activity or what were the things that people were most interested in and then use that as a framework for being able to guide future professional development. So the goal is not necessarily to monetize this in any way. Again, I believe very heavily in public scholarship and the purpose of this is to train teachers. The information that we're collecting or, or have the potential to collect is all designed around the notion of helping educators get better at what they do and helping administrators use big data to be able to make sense of that. And then finally, uh, the big picture for us is to focus on all of the ISTE standards. So by the time that this is finished, uh, Act 2, in addition to Act 1, our goal is to help educators think through how did the ISTE standards apply to this particular experience? How can I use this to reflect on my practices as an educator? And again, going back to that one-to-one -one ratio from the very beginning, how do I take this idea or this, this content and apply it in the real world in my own classroom environment? How do I help myself become a better educator so that I can help my students be more effective learners? And uh, we're, we're really happy with the way that this has worked out, that based on feedback from our trials focus groups with individuals that are part of the program currently, as well as people who are outside of the program entirely, uh, that it communicates this, these ideas not just to educators, but also to other people outside the realm of education who are interested in being better at communicating with people or engaging in rhetoric and debate and persuasion. All of which are really important if you actually care about those educational philosophies that I mentioned being sort of a foundational uh, element of this design. So just to quickly revisit these ideas, the game is built around contemporary learning theory and best practices for educators. It's built around the TPAC model and the ISD standards, specifically for educators, but also with utility for other individuals. And we're trying to, as hard as we can to maintain that one-to-one -one ratio between gameplay objectives and learning objectives so that the players are actually applying the things we want them to learn in the teacher education program um, as they would apply them in the real world, talking with other teachers, colleagues, administrators, students, parents, uh, and other stakeholders that are associated with the realm of education. So if you're interested in trying the game for yourselves, which I, we have some time left over and I was going to hand back to you and mm -hmm. see back to you, um, you can go to eos503.com. It'll bring you straight to the gameplay page. There's nothing you need to do to log in. Uh, you can just click play now. Um, I will qualify that by saying that WebGL, Unity, and Google Chrome do not play well together. So if you try to open this in Google Chrome, it will probably not work or it will work sluggishly. Uh, we recommend using Safari, Microsoft Edge, or Mozilla Firefox as being the browser of choice to be able to play this. Um, currently, it is not available on Steam or for iPad slash tablet, but that is one of the things that we have in development because ideally we would like educators to be able to do this on whatever device they have. Um, and that, again, is one of the reasons why we've kept this browser based. We want everybody to be able to play it on whatever format makes the most sense for them in whatever scale makes the most sense for them. We're continuing to do updates. Uh, we are continuing to develop. We have a conference going on here at UConn, June 1st through 3rd, called Frontiers in Playful Learning, where we'll be doing sort of a soft launch of this. So uh, we'll have a bunch of scholars from around the country, uh, including Canada and the EU, who are here. And our goal is then to communicate this information to a broader population of teacher educators around the country. So uh, if you know other people who might be interested in this project, please do share the information about it with them. There's also a page on our EdTech website at UConn. Um, I will likely upload some form of this presentation after today to be able to communicate these ideas as well. But it has a, a written out version of basically what I've described to you this morning, such that uh, other people who weren't present will be able to learn a little bit about it as well. Um, I do want to thank everybody who helped work on this project. It's been an, in development in this form for the last two and a half years throughout the pandemic. We have a number of really talented former UConn students slash current UConn students, including my um, doctoral student Coulter Moose, who couldn't be here today, but who has also been a really important part of developing this. He's using this for his dissertation, and uh, ultimately that's what that log file data you looked at is going to be utilized for, so that he can publish uh, some papers about how this works and what the potential utility is for other educators. 
We also have a number of talented designers who uh, we've gotten to apprentice or hire on, um, all of whom were paid for their uh, work on this project and continue to be paid um, as exercise in getting them to be professional game designers. That's what they want to do. And so thanks to all of them for their really hard work for creating something we're all really proud of. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But otherwise, please feel free to play around with EOS 503. I will say that the beginning portion of this is a little uh, text heavy, so you will probably want to take some time apart from this presentation to explore, but we encourage you to come back to it. And I will also add that although the save feature is not currently impl implemented, we do have a save feature that should be ready in the next couple of weeks such that if you can only play for a few minutes at a time, you'll be able to save your progress and come back to it uh, and, and be able to return in, in whatever um, timeline you like. Thank you very much.